Beam me up, Scotty. Energize. Good evening, Toastmasters and guests. I'm actually not going to talk about Star Trek this evening. After all, the transporter isn't a real thing. Then again, neither is the holodeck. Where I'm standing now. Well, in certain ways, the we're closer to a holodeck than a transporter. But I digress. I am here this evening to talk about energy. Modern society depends on energy. We use energy to travel, to heat and cool our homes, to power our computers and all our other gadgets, and to heat, wash and dry our clothes and to cook our food and to light our buildings. You name it, it needs energy. And in the modern world, more and more, that means electricity. Because things that used to all be other fuels, like gasoline and diesel fuel to, to run our cars or natural gas to eat our homes are gradually switching to electricity because there are ways to make that more efficient. You can actually heat a, a, a house more efficiently with modern heat pump with electricity than by burning something, even though 100% of what you burn seems to turn into heat. It's pretty amazing. But how do we get that electricity? Well, it's really kind of complicated. There are basically a few different ways that you can get electricity. You can burn stuff, which by and large means fossil fuels. You can burn oil, you can burn coal, you can burn natural gas. You have nuclear power, which is these big power plants that sometimes have problems, which we'll get to that, but they're very efficient at generating electricity. And then there are renewable resources, wind, solar, and hydropower, the main each of these has advantages and disadvantages, and they're used around the world to varying degrees. For example, in 2020, US electricity production was 38% natural gas, 22% coal, 19% nuclear, 9% wind, 6% hydro, and just 3% solar power. In Europe, the mix is a little different. With nuclear at the top, mainly thanks to France, 25% nuclear, 19% natural gas, 15% coal, 13% wind, 12% hydro, and 6% solar. So with all the talk from politicians and protesters and scientists, oh my, about the problems with burning stuff to produce electricity, and with all the worries about running out of the stuff to burn to produce electricity, and especially recently with the higher costs of burning, getting the stuff to burn to generate electricity, why are we still burning stuff to generate between a third and a half of our electricity? Well, change isn't easy. Nobody likes change except maybe vending machine operators. The alternatives to fossil fuel plants are to generate electricity fall into three categories and each one has its issues. First is nuclear power plants. Nuclear power plant is arguably, according to many scientists, really the best for the planet. There's no carbon dioxide, there's no smog, it's not dependent on the time of day or the weather uh, or big, messing up big rivers. But as we know, unfortunately, from Chernobyl and Fukushima, nuclear power has its risks. Plus, for better or worse, nuclear power is very closely associated with nuclear bombs. So nuclear energy is not such an easy thing. The plants are very expensive. Some of the company, countries that have been relying on nuclear energy are phasing it out. The ones that still have it and are still keeping it are very slow to add more nuclear power. So not so simple. Next comes wind. Wind power has been around for a long time, starting with windmills, which would spin around and turn some machinery that would be used to grind grain or do other things. Modern wind turbines are very efficient at generating electricity, but there's one problem. They only work when the wind blows. The wind stops, it stops generating power. And when the wind starts up again, it starts again, and you can't control that. The next comes hydro. Now, hydro does not, which is basically hydroelectricity is when you have rivers, they're dammed up to stop the water, and then the water flows down through a turbine. The good news there is we can control when it happens. We control how much it happens, but it has its costs too. For example, the Three Gorges Dam was recently built in China. It took nine years to build. It opened in 2003 cost $31 billion and more than a million people had to be relocated in the area that was flooded to make the reservoir. So there are costs there too. Finally, solar. Solar in some ways is the best. 
we know exactly, it doesn't go 24 hours a day, it goes half the time. But we know exactly when that half of the time they will be. So we can predict in advance how much it will generate. And unlike these others, which are mostly dependent on huge plants, you can have solar on top of your house. When it produces more than you need, it pumps it into the utility grid. The utility power goes out, you can still have power if it's all put together right. So it can work very well but it's expensive to put it in. So it's still only a small part of the electricity generation around the world. So where does that leave us? None of us want to get rid of electricity. We need it for everything we do. And we want more of it, but nobody wants a new power plant of any type in their backyard. Maybe the one exception is to have solar on their roof. And plenty of people are worried about the environmental stuff, whether it's a nuclear plant exploding, it's a big problem, or turbines hitting birds, or, of course, burning and putting all kinds of nasty, burning things and putting all kinds of nasty stuff in the air. Everything has its problems. None of them are perfect. As usual, Elon Musk to the rescue. Well, not just Elon Musk. Plenty of talented scientists and engineers around the world are working on solutions to some of the problems, in particular, the intermittent nature of wind and solar uh, power. And the solution is batteries. Well, really big batteries huge batteries, actually ginormous batteries. Ginormous is a real word, it's in the Scrabble dictionary, so that's good. These are called mega packs. A mega pack is the size of a shipping container and Tesla builds these things. Each one's a big battery and they put a whole bunch of them, they put a hundred of them together on a big empty lot and some special electronics hooked up to it. So then when there's a dip in the power grid because the wind stopped blowing, it will push extra power out. Or when there's all of a sudden more power being generated, it will store that power for when it's needed. And this makes it possible to take intermittent power sources or intermittent usage and smooth out the grid, which has always been a problem. And they're able to do it in a way that actually saves utilities money. The other technology, and a lot of people are working on this too, is power transmission. This has been an issue within the United States but imagine if you took the whole world together and the places that had the wind blowing but had more power than they need could send it to the other side of the world. And the people who had solar power going because it was sunny but had more power than they need could send it to the dark side of the world and even things out. So these are technologies in process and we will talk more about them in another speech. Back to you, Toast